So I want to transition um, from a community perspective that we just had to now a clinical perspective in terms of its um, relationship to precision health. So I'd like to have invite Lori Campos Coyer and then Sigurdis Harold's daughter um, to come after Lori to give us a clinical perspective on precision health. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So make sure you can all hear me. I want to thank all of you for inviting me here today. I'm probably going to give the most different kind of presentation today because it's going to be my personal story. Um, and do I have my slide right there? So my story is about living with Lynch syndrome. And my story actually begins with these two. This is my mom and dad. This is Lita and Rudy Campos. They're really happy here because they just met Don Ho. How many of you know the legendary Hawaiian singer Don Ho? So they're very happy here. But my story of Lynch syndrome starts with my dad. So he was first diagnosed when I was 13 years old, but I didn't know it. We didn't talk about it. I knew he was going through treatment, but my mom and dad never sat my brother and I down to talk about it. He got better and life went on. Four years later, he had a recurrence. I was 17. I heard that it was cancer, but I wasn't sure. I didn't ask, and they didn't tell us. I knew my dad was in treatment. His skin was getting dark. I could hear him throwing up in the bathroom, but we didn't talk about it. He got better, and for the next eight years, we had a normal life. I graduated from high school, graduated from college, had my first job. And then when I was 25, my dad had his second recurrence. I knew it was cancer, but I didn't know what kind of cancer. So while my dad was in the hospital, I sat down with him on the bed and I said, Dad, can you tell me what kind of cancer it is? And he just, he looked down at the floor and he said, I want you to talk to Dr. Yu. Now Dr. Yu was his oncologist. So my mom and I, and my brother, talked to Dr. Yu and found out that the cancer was colon cancer that it had spread throughout his body, it was in his lungs, and he developed a tumor in his right artery in his leg. And they were gonna do as the most that they can to make the rest of his life comfortable. The last two weeks of his life in the hospital, he asked me to cover the windows of his door to his hospital room so that no one could see him. And this is because in my culture, my Filipino culture, there's a lot of shame associated with having cancer. There are thoughts that maybe cancer is contagious or that it's punishment for something that you've done. My dad died at the age of 51 on August 10th, 1991. He was 39 when he was diagnosed. And while he was in the hospital, he left me this list of things to do. Now, the first one was call the US Navy, arrange for an honor guard, my dad spent 22 years in the Navy. He fought in the Vietnam War and was very proud. So I did that. And the other things were what to do with his books and what to do with his clothes. But the last three things on his list were the most important. So number 24 was make sure your brother graduates from college. And I did that. Michael graduated from college. Number 25 was take care of your mom. I still take care of my mom. She's sitting over there. <laughs> And number 26 was do not tell anyone of my disease. Now, I would have kept that promise to him if I hadn't been diagnosed with cancer myself. Six years later, I was diagnosed with a stage three endometrial cancer. Two years after that, my brother was diagnosed with colon cancer. Now, I remember my oncologist telling me, we don't have a lot of information on how to treat a 30-year-old with this diagnosis, so you're young, we're gonna be aggressive, and they were. I had surgery, I had chemotherapy, I had radiation. So now at this point, I'm like, Dad, now I can't remain silent. I started volunteering and speaking out and being vocal, hoping that my story would resonate with someone else and they would be able to ask questions or they could go to their doctor and say, you know, I'm not really feeling well. So some of that volunteering, I testified at the President's Cancer Panel I accepted a four-year federal appointment to an advisory board that reported directly to the MCI director. And the other was I served on the board of the American Cancer Society of the Silicon Valley region. 
And that is where I met Dr. Fisher. How many of you know Dr. George Fisher? He's a medical oncologist here at Stanford. He focuses on gastrointestinal cancers. Now, we were on the board together, and I saw on the agenda he was going to do a presentation on genetic cancers, hereditary cancers. And I thought, oh, this must be about breast cancer, because that's I only hear about breast cancer and genetics. But he's a GI doctor, so this is going to be really interesting. I wonder if there's something that I can learn from it. So at his presentation, Dr. Fisher used this slide, Lynch syndrome pedigree. And this is how he explained it. Mom and dad, dad has colon cancer, son and daughter, daughter has endometrial cancer, and son has colon cancer. And I sat there, and I couldn't breathe. I could feel my heart drop to my stomach. I felt like I wanted to throw up. And as he was talking and talking about the risk and about other cancers, this is what I was thinking of. Mom and dad, dad has colon cancer, son and daughter, daughter has endometrial cancer, son has colon cancer. I had so many questions for Dr. Fisher. I talked to him for a while, and then I talked to my oncologist, and after many conversations, I decided to get tested, and I tested positive for Lynch syndrome. Now, what does this mean for me, being tested for Lynch syndrome? This means that my health care is a little different from someone else who doesn't have Lynch syndrome. So for the past 20 years, I've had, and you're going to know a lot about me after this, I've had a colonoscopy or two or three every year. I've had polyps removed every single time. They were all highly dysplastic. They were precancerous. And I knew that every time he removed a polyp, he was saving my life. Now, a little over a year ago, I had a flat polyp. It was not easily biopsied. And because of my diagnosis of Lynch syndrome, it was recommended that I have the right side of my colon removed. So in June last year, I had a hemicolectomy, and the pathology came back to no one's surprise as colon cancer. Now another risk of, colon cancer, of Lynch syndrome is skin cancer. So I did skin checks. And then last February, I was diagnosed with melanoma, and I had surgery in March. But the good thing, silver lining about all of this, is that because I had this genetic test done, because my doctors knew I had Lynch syndrome, these cancers were caught early. This is what precision medicine can do. Precision medicine is saving my life. So what do I do now? I'm still really active as a patient advocate. I share my story anywhere I can so that people will know to that they can talk to their doctor about Lynch syndrome. Maybe they have a friend who's been through something like this. That is my goal. But also weighing heavily on my mind are these two. This is my 14-year-old, six foot, one inch nephew, Jordan, who's a high school freshman. He's right over there laughing at me. <laughs> and that is my 18-year-old mechanical engineering second-year college student niece, Malia. <laughs> so as a family, we've talked about Lynch syndrome. We've talked with geneticists about it. We understand their risk. We know what we need to do moving forward in their health care. Precision medicine is what is going to prevent them from ever having to suffer through what I've been through and what my dad has gone through. And so I, I want to thank all of you who are doing this kind of research because there's a personal meaning to me and my family and a personal meaning to the future of my family. So when I do things like this, uh, I feel a little guilty. Remember, number 26 was do not tell anyone of my disease. Uh, my dad really felt that keeping that information only within the family was a way to protect us, was a way to 
so that we wouldn't lose our community support. Because if you think about it, here's my mom. So it's her husband and her two children. My dad would not have wanted me to talk about it. But I know that he would want me to do anything I could do to save my family, to improve their lives. And so that is why I'm standing here in front of you today talking about Lynch syndrome. And I, I don't think I explained what Lynch syndrome was. I know Dr. Held's daughter is going to do that, but just briefly, Lynch syndrome is a genetic condition that increases your risk of colorectal and endometrial cancers before the age of 50. My dad, my brother, and I were 30 when we were diagnosed. So now that you know all this about me, I want you to be able to share the story. I want you to tell people how precision medicine and participating in genetic research and in genetic testing can save your life. I know that I will have to go through more things, but I stay positive about it because my doctors know what I have and they are saving my life every single time. But this is who I want to concentrate on. I don't want them to ever have to get sick. So thank you, all of you who are doing this kind of research. It means the world to me, and thank you for inviting me here today. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here today to talk about Lynch syndrome. But first and foremost, I want to thank Lori for sharing her story with us to really give a face to this syndrome that we're going to discuss um, and I'm a medical oncologist, so my boss is Dr. George Fisher, who sent me here today to talk about this. But I deal with gastrointestinal cancers, and, and, and every day I think about whether we can detect Lynch syndrome in any, any of my patients. And it's really, uh, I think we, we can do two things when it comes to Lynch syndrome. We can both use precision health and precision medicine to help people. In terms of precision health, I think about that as identifying individuals with this cancer syndrome before they develop cancer and really try to prevent as many of them as we can. And I'm going to talk about how we perform universal screening to try to detect as many as possible. And then we can also today use precision medicine because we have learned a lot about the molecular biology of these tumors. And uh, Lynch syndrome associated cancers are one of the tumors that can respond to immunotherapy. And I'll show you a couple of slides on that. So Lynch syndrome is an inherited cancer syndrome, can increase the risk of many cancers, but really the top four are your colorectal, uterine, ovarian, and stomach cancers. Uh, they are caused by mutations in mismatch repair genes that were discovered back in the 1990s. We have four genes, and we know that this is the most common reason for inherited colorectal cancer. Uh, in the populations where this has been investigated, the majority of mutations happen in the first two genes, MLH1 and MSH2. And they are, are associated with a higher risk of cancer than the other two genes, MSH6 and PMS2. Now, it's an autosomal dominant syndrome, meaning that if you have a parent who is born with a mutation in one of these genes, uh, as this father with an MLH1 mutation, the, the children have a 50% chance of inheriting the syndrome. It is named after this man, Dr. Henry Lynch, who I had the honor of meeting back in 2013. Uh, Dr. Lynch had come across a patient way back when he was an internal medicine resident who was admitted with DTs. And when Dr. Lynch asked him why he, why he drank so much, the patient said, well, I am destined to develop colorectal cancer uh, as most of the people in my family, I might as well drink. <laughs> uh, so Dr. Lynch got interested in his family history and encountered other patients who had similar family histories where you would see a, a multiple relatives with stomach, uterine, and colon cancers, and many of them at a young age in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So we, we also know that when an individual has Lynch syndrome, they inherit, uh, we have 23 chromosome pairs. We inherit one allele from mom and one from dad. And 
really, in order for cancer to develop, something has to happen to the other allele, a mutation or inactivation by methylation for cancer to develop and, and would ha happen most commonly in the colonic mucosa. And that means that the cancer risk is not 100%. Um, if we compare it to the general population, most of us um, will have a 4 to 5% lifetime risk of colorectal cancer, for example. But if you're born with a mutation in either MLH1 or MSH2, that risk goes up significantly, can be as high as 80% during an individual's lifetime. We know that it is lower with mutations in MSH6 and PMS2, but still significantly higher than in the general population. We know that other cancers are also associated with the syndrome, other gastrointestinal cancer, skin cancer, brain cancer, and, and kidney cancer. So what markers do we have to identify Lynch syndrome? Well, we have two markers that we can employ on the tumor, on the cancer themselves. Microsatellite instability was the first marker identified and really was found before we found the actual genes. We have about half a million microsatellites in our genome. They're basically repeats of nucleotide. And when individuals with Lynch syndrome develop cancer, those nucleotide repeats can become shorter or longer in the tumor. And so microsatellite instability is comparing this in the tumor and the normal DNA and finding uh, differing lengths. It is probably more common today to simply take the, the tumor and stain it for these four mismatch repair proteins to try to figure out whether the individual can have Lynch syndrome or not. And both of these methods test for inactivation of something called the mismatch repair system. And bear with me for a couple of slides. I want to just briefly talk about what the system does. Um, whenever a cell divides, we need to replicate our DNA. And the mismatch repair system is a DNA repair system that helps the cell do so correctly. So it is a proofreading mechanism. We'll slide down the, the newly synthesized DNA strand and find any incorrectly paired bases and uh, correct those. Now, if we have an individual with an inactivation of the MLH1 gene because of a mutation, for example, they can develop cancers where these proteins are missing. That's how we would detect them. And it is actually quite common to see an activation of the mismatch repair system in both colorectal cancer and uterine cancer, 15 and 20% of all. But that does not mean that all of them have Lynch syndrome. Uh, most, the most common reason would be a sporadic inactivation of the MLH1 gene. So when you hear that someone has an MSI uh, tumor does not automatically mean Lynch syndrome, could also simply be sporadic. And even more rare, rare causes uh, just double somatic mutations in these mismatch repair genes that only occur in the tumor. So what do we know about the prevalence of Lynch syndrome in different populations? Well, it's been investigated quite a bit, and I really want to highlight these are population-based cohort of cancer patients, either colorectal or uterine cancer patients. And I really want to highlight four studies. Dr. Della Chappelle uh, performed the first population-based study in Finland in 98. In colorectal cancer, found 2.7% of those patients to have Lynch syndrome and estimated the population frequency to be 1 in 740. But Dr. Della Chappelle later moved to Ohio State University where he repeated a, a very similar study, looked at colorectal cancer, 1,500 patients. 2.8% had Lynch syndrome, but here the population frequency was estimated to be higher, one in 370. And then two recent studies, one of which we performed in my home country of Iceland, estimated the prevalence to be even higher than one in 370. So uh, one in 279 in, in, in a study looking at the US, Canada, and Australia. And in Iceland, one in 226, which is the highest prevalence uh, described in any population. So I want to just tell you a, a little bit more about this, the, the, our Icelandic study. So Iceland uh, was settled in 874 by Vikings who sailed from Scandinavia and picked up some X chromosomes in the Gaelic countries and then sailed <laughs> to this isolated island where they remained isolated for centuries. 
Now, before we started this study, we, we did not know of anyone with Lynch syndrome in the country uh, and, and really thought that maybe it just didn't exist. Iceland is really the perfect place to do a study like this, though, because we have fantastic registries. We know how everyone's related in the country. And our cancer registry and tumor bank has collected tissue and cancer diagnosis for decades. And then we have a company that has uh, made good use of all of that, Deco Genetics. They've collected blood on about half the nation. And they are doing genotype, phenotype studies, not only in cancer, but cardiovascular disease and, and neurologic disease. But so we were able to tap into this and look at all colorectal cancers diagnosed over a 10-year period and link them up with this information from Decode Genetics. And I'm just going to go straight to, to the results. So we found this high prevalence of Lynch syndrome. One in 226 individuals carries this in the country. It means that we have about 1,400 individuals with it in the country. Now, if they were undergoing cancer screening, we could prevent up, uh, above uh, over 300 cancers in these people. But really, one of the unique features was that we found three founder mutations and all in three genes, uh, the, all in two genes, the two genes that are associated with a lower lifetime risk of cancer. Um, compared to the MLH1 and MSH2 genes. So even though we have a high prevalence of Lynch syndrome, it is, it is these more favorable genes that, are, that most mutations are in. So what, what, what do we know about the scope of Lynch syndrome in the US? Well, we have estimated that there are probably more than 1.2 million individuals with this syndrome in, in, in our country. Most of them, 95%, are unaware of carrying Lynch syndrome, but clearly, if they, if they knew and we could do cancer screening and prevent cancers, we could prevent a lot of cancers. Um, I do want to emphasize that it, we, it is very important that for each individual that we find that we really get the whole family in to test them because we, we want to try to uh, find people before they develop cancers. So how do we find individuals with Lynch syndrome? Well, we used to have these clinical criteria where you had to get a detailed family history, you had to know exactly what type of cancers people were diagnosed with and at what age. And even these criteria, they weren't all that sensitive in finding Lynch syndrome. Uh, it's also very time consuming, and so physicians just often weren't, weren't following the guidelines. So we have shied away from using this and really gone to what we call universal screening, which means testing all colorectal and endometrial cancer cases um, with either this, the MSI testing or, as shown here, with immunohistochemistry staining for the proteins. And this is now recommended in Europe and the United States by, by many, uh, many groups, and we're actively doing this. Now, we know that when we find individuals with Lynch syndrome, screening for cancers can be very effective. Um, there was an old study published 17 years ago that had followed a cohort of individuals with Lynch syndrome. One, one part of the cohort uh, did colonoscopies every one to two years, and the other part was, was, uh, didn't follow the guidelines. But you can see how it decreased both colorectal cancer and overall mortality. Same thing for, for women screening for uh, uterine and ovarian cancers and doing prophylactic surgeries can really uh, take the risk of those cancers down to zero percent. And so here's, here are cancer screening guidelines. So in Lynch syndrome, you do colonoscopies, you start them early, and you have to do them frequently every one to two years. You do want to screen for uterine and ovarian cancers and, and consider risk-reducing surgery after childbearing. In MLH1 and MSH2 mutations, you can screen for urinary cancers and gastric cancers. Um, and we recommend aspirin for everyone, as it can decrease the risk of colorectal cancer. So at Stanford, we have been screening cancers uh, for several years. And we recently included screening all gastrointestinal cancers. I've been doing that since uh, beginning of 2016. And clearly, we refer patients to the cancer genetics clinic if it is abnormal, so they can have germline testing um, to formally diagnose this. Just a couple of slides on precision medicine. So we know that Lynch syndrome associated cancers, they develop a high mutational burden because this DNA repair system isn't functional. Um, 
And we know that these cells, they look quite foreign to the immune system, but the cancer cells are, are smart and they express something called PDL1 that kind of stops the immune system in their tracks. Now we have uh, these new drugs, these immunotherapy drugs that can block this inhibitory bond and really allow the immune system to recognize the cancers. And this is a, a clinical trial that got published two years ago. It was really groundbreaking. If you look at the blue and black columns, these are the patients with the mismatch repair deficient, either colorectal cancer or other cancers. And here you see the decrease in tumor burden. 60 to 70% of people had a decrease in tumor burden. And many of these patients have been on this ther therapy for two, three, four years. Patients with metastatic disease so it has really changed a lot. And this led to the FDA approving Keytruda or pembrolizumab in metastatic disease if you have this, these MSI higher mismatch repair deficient cancers uh, that, that, that are related to Lynch syndrome. And so in summary, we have talked about Lynch syndrome being common, probably in many populations, the most common inherited cancer syndrome can affect upwards of one in 200 individuals. We're trying to find people by universally screening tumors. And then if we find individuals with Lynch syndrome to get the, affected, the unaffected family members tested because prevention is key here. We can prevent many of these cancers by screening. And lastly, we've talked about immunotherapy and how that is changing really how we treat these uh, patients if they develop metastatic disease. And with that, I thank you. Thank you both for giving us a wonderful clinical perspective. I really, really appreciate that. That was wonderful.